Okay, I'll talk about a hot topic today, the carb controversy and how you could help paleo save America. This is a basic view of human evolution, and as you know, this took millions of years, right? While the modern obesity epidemic, most of it has happened in 28 years. So why is this? Well, the conventional answer is that people just eat too much, too many calories. They've all turned into gluttons, right? So has this way of thinking helped us? No, hardly, because more and more Americans are becoming obese, and according to this new prognosis, extreme obesity is just exploding in America, and this is gonna bring the US healthcare system to its knees. It's gonna bring the US economy to its knees, and it's gonna bring enormous amounts of suffering and disease. So it has to be stopped. Luckily, paleo came along and emphasized the quality of the food, and this merry band of rebels. They were <laughs> led by the brave Mark Sisson, <laughs> the wise Warren Cordain, and the cute one, Rob Wolf. <laughs> and in their books, they told people that it's not the fat you need to fear. It's the refined sugar and the grains. And specifically, they said that if you eat a low-carb or a low-glycemic low load diet, you will lower your insulin, and this will help with weight loss. But this is all being questioned today on influential paleo blogs, uh, discussion forums, and, and so on. And we're seeing a backlash and a comeback of calories. Calories are striking back. <laughs> And the argument is that carbs doesn't matter, and macronutrients don't matter, and, and insulin has nothing to do with weight gain. And this, this old simplistic calorie thinking, meaning it's all about calories, and this thinking is now wrapped up in something called food reward, which is interesting, and I'm gonna talk more about it, but my point here is that as paleo has grown and become more popular, it's being sucked back into old, failed conventional wisdom. And uh, I fear that if the calorie counters win, it would be like putting lipstick on a pig. <laughs> the pig being failed old, uh, simplistic calorie thinking and the, the lipstick food reward. So this could be the future of paleo, a pig with lipstick, meaning people will be eating 100 calorie packs of gluten-free junk food marketed as paleo. And that's not gonna solve much. It's not gonna stop the epidemic. We need a better foundation. So, what is the difference between an obese and a thin person? How do we explain common obesity? Well, I'm a family doctor. I treat a lot of obese patients. I, read about this, think about this, and I used to find it confusing still. But I think it makes sense. Because an obese person usually have high levels of insulin, abnormally high, while a thin person has low or normal insulin. And this has been shown in a number of studies, so it's, it's not controversial. And when I test my obese patients in my clinic, their insulin level is usually very high. But it gets more interesting because you can raise your insulin in a variety of ways, and usually you're gonna gain weight too. First example, type two diabetes. These people usually have high levels of insulin, and they usually gain weight every year, become more and more obese. Another way of seeing it going down from high insulin level to, to lower, usually leads to weight loss. And the most striking example, of course, is type 1 diabetes, which is uh, uh, the body can't produce insulin, so the levels are extremely low, and the weight plummets without treatment. Here's a sad picture. It's from the early 1900s, and kids, with type 1 diabetes basically starved to death. 
but not this, this, not this kid. He was fortunate enough to be one of the first to be treated with insulin, and his weight returned, and his life was saved. So I think he would smile a bit more, perhaps. <laughs> so loss of insulin, loss of weight. And going the other way with insulin injections means weight gain. More insulin, more weight gain. It's a common side effect. You know what this is? Looks like a guy who got silicone implants in a weird place. <laughs> of course, it's not silicone, it's fat deposits. And this is a type 1 diabetic. And for 31 years, he injected his insulin either to the left or to the right of his belly button. So, this is the local effect of, of high-dose insulin. And anyone who looks at this picture and says that insulin has nothing to do with fat accumulation, well, that person must be blind, right? It's obvious. So, injecting insulin means weight gain and avoiding insulin. Avoiding insulin is actually a common and dangerous eating disorder in uh, type 1 diabetics, they let their blood sugar get high because they know, uh, which, which is very bad for their health, obviously, because they know that less insulin means they will lose weight. Okay, so this is uh, different kinds of uh, diabetes and, and injecting insulin, but what about if the body makes too much insulin for a completely different reason? Well, there is a disease called insulinoma, which is a rare tumor that produces insulin. And these patients, they usually, they can be, become ravenously hungry and quickly gain weight. And a colleague told me a story about an elderly lady who got this disease. And uh, she was old and she didn't want to have surgery, didn't want to take the tumor out, so it, it grew and grew. And eventually, she had to use her alarm, alarm clock to get up every two hours during the night to eat. And she became massively obese. Going the other direction again, if we block the body's production of insulin, what happens? Well, there's a drug doing that. It's called octreotide. And it's actually a good treatment for some obese patients. Like Professor Robert Lustig talks about his, his studies. Um, but leaving all these diseases and drugs, the easiest way by far to raise your insulin, and the tastiest way, of course, is high-carb junk food, like this. And I don't think it's controversial to say that this is the number one problem for weight control. And I don't think it's a coincidence that this is also the most effective way to raise your insulin. So high-carb junk food, more insulin, more weight. Opposite, low-carb diets. Lower your insulin, the most simplest way to do that, and uh, they're also effective for weight loss. In fact, there are a number of studies testing this, comparing low-fat diets to low-carb diets for weight loss. And time after time, it turns out low-carb means you get a more effective weight loss without without hunger. And if you look at all the statistically significant results, 17 studies now show that low carb gives you better weight loss than low fat. I know of no such study showing the opposite. And if you want to take a look at these, you can find them on my blog, dietdoctor.com. So, low carb diets are good for weight loss. But, and despite what some people claim, they also lower insulin. Not by a little, but by a lot. Take a look at, look at this. Um, here's insulin levels after eating and uh, after three different kinds of, of diets. And the red line is a low-carb diet. Here's another study showing the exact same thing. Not a little lower insulin, but a lot lower. So insulin plummets on a strict low-carb diet. Low carb means weight loss and lower insulin. Finally, exercise. You know, sedentary living means that you're going to burn less carbs. 
and when you eat carbs, they will raise your insulin higher. And it's also connected to weight gain. Opposite, exercise means you burn more carbs, your insulin will stay lower after eating carbs, and it's connected to weight loss. So whichever way you look at it, more insulin, more weight, and vice versa. But some people don't believe in this anyway. They have objections. And uh, let's have a quick look at the four main ones. The first one, of course, is that only calories matter, right? And allegedly, weight gain results from a positive caloric balance, while weight loss results from a negative one. Um, and the problem with this is it's very simple, seductive, but it's an oversimplification. And the problem is that it ignores the causes. For example, the causes we just discussed. And to put this, uh, to, to have an example to make it a bit more clear, um, you can take a look at constipation. Now, has anyone in here ever been constipated? Could you raise your arm? <laughs> Few people, yeah. So you know, um, there are different causes to constipation, right? Like dehydration, like uh, iron supplements, and so on. And if you want to avoid getting constipated or, or, or treat it, you better treat these causes, right? But a calorie counter would tell you that that is irrelevant. He would say that this constipation thing only has one cause, and that is a positive fecal balance. <laughs> Is, is, is true. It is true, don't laugh. Um, and if you were constipated, he would tell you, ignore all this quack advice. All you need to do is to eat less and defecate more. <laughs> and it's a smart ass comment, right? It's silly. Well, same thing with calories. Because if we ignore the causes, then we can't treat it effectively. So this is a simplistic old advice. We need to get beyond that because it's not very helpful. Second objection is that this is all about the hormone leptin. Controls weight. You know leptin? It's um, the hormone from our fat stores going to our brains, telling us that we have plenty of energy stores, right? We don't need to eat. Problem is a chronically high insulin can block this effect. So the brain can't see the fat stores, thinks we're starving even though we're not. And that is how, lept how, how insulin can override leptin if it's chronically elevated. And that's why if your insulin is sky high, your leptin is not going to save you. And we shouldn't be surprised because the same thing is true for other hormones like cortisol, stress hormone, right? If it's really high, you gain weight. Leptin don't save you there either. Same thing with insulin. Third objection, and a really interesting one, is that only food reward matters. So, food reward theory says that some food is so rewarding, so palatable, that we can't stop ourselves from eating too much of it. Interestingly, this is often the same high-carb junk food uh, um, that is highly rewarding. Although, to be fair, sometimes it can be a good idea to add a little bit of fat to make it even more irresistible, right? Mm. And, and food reward could be a, um, a topic for an entire lecture. But um, I'll get straight to the bottom line. What we're talking about is addictive properties of food and food addiction. And um, and fast food can be ad addictive, and indeed, food manufacturers, they, they go out of their way to make it as addictive as they possibly can, because that way they sell more, right? What happens if you get addicted to high-carb junk food? Well, your insulin is going to rise high, and you're going to gain weight. So, I don't think uh, we need to choose between insulin and food reward to explain obesity, because they work perfectly together. Thank you. And food reward, while it might be, might be uh, uh, important, 
it's not the entire puzzle. We need more explanations than that. So the fourth and last objection, what about, <laughs> what about them? Right? What about the thin Asians? What about the Japanese? What about the Chinese? They eat all that rice, you know it, and they're thin. And what about the Kitavans and all the other guys? I mean, there's loads of these populations you can pull out. Uh, so I think just by looking at this, it's obvious that everybody doesn't have to avoid all carbs. Avoiding just the worst ones, like refined sugar, flour, can be enough. Question is, can you tolerate safe carbs, safe starches? Well, do you look like this? or a female version of him, then the answer is probably yes. And, uh, and paleo isn't necessarily a very low-carb diet. If you're thin, if you're metabolically healthy, you can probably tolerate all the fruit you want, I think. But the problem is that most Americans and Western people in general don't look like this anymore. A lot of people are looking more like this, <laughs> right? With the, weight issues, uh, high blood pressure, perhaps even uh, borderline diabetes, and then very few carbs are safe. And a very low carb diet may be the best way to go. So sensitivity to carbs vary from person to person. But there is one thing that is a disaster for anybody, and that's to do what most Americans outside of this room are doing right now. Eating high carb junk food once in a while, and leading sedentary lives. This will sooner or later result in weight loss for the large majority, uh, weight gain for the large majority of people. On the other hand, there's you guys. And my guess is that you have probably been eating a low carb diet, or at least lower carb, uh, slower carb than most people and, and doing some form of, of exercise. And that is, and you understand how this works. And that is why you could help to save America, because we can spread this message and we can break this epidemic. And we can inspire people to improve their lives, one person after another, friends and family, like these three people who let me share their success with giving up sugar and starch. This is David before and after, without hunger. This is Josephine before and after, without counting any calories. And this is Freddy, before and after, with a lower insulin. And, and uh, this, this is the kind of change that we can inspire in others. And here's my daughter, who's 11 months old. And as she grows older, I, would, I hope that she never feels the need to be hungry never bothers counting calories, and never sees food as an enemy. I hope her future is brighter. So what will the future look like? Well, if we can inspire most people to eat real food and avoid bad carbs, that could revolutionize the health of the world. And that is how paleo could save America. Thank you. We can uh, take a few questions until the next presentation is ready to go. What's happening in Sweden? Well, we, we've experienced a butter shortage because people eat more fat and less, less bread and less sugar. So low-carb diets are very popular. Yeah, well, there is a survey from last year that found that 23% uh, of the population were eating some form of low-carb diet, and 5% and were eating a very strict low-carb diet. So, and I think it's even more popular today. So it's big. It's getting big. Yes? Presentation on the drive. How I feed my daughter. Well, actually, can you Really? Yeah, I can give it to you right now. Yeah. Well, I don't have my computer yeah. with me. It's back. Well, no Cheerios. Yeah. Okay. No, no. Uh, so uh, uh, she's still breastfeeding and she eats real food. She eats some carbs, like 
a little bit of potatoes and vegetables and so on, but she eats real food. She eats basically what, the same thing as, as her mom and I eat. So. Andreas, I have a question. Yes. Yeah, great talk, and certainly this whole approach worked for me, and I, I think it's great. But one of the objections you hear comes from people who did actually lose quite a bit of weight on a low-carb diet, and they stalled, and they feel that somehow or other it's not enough, and so that they then have to, on top of it, even though their insulin is reduced, reduce calories. So they're the ones who often challenge the theory because they say, hey, if this is the only thing I have to worry about, why can't I... Why am I stuck here? Why am I plateaued? I have another 20 pounds to lose. I'm low carb. I'm stuck. So what do you say to those people? Well, um, obviously, there's not one solution that works perfectly for all problems. And uh, there can be other problems that are not really necessarily related to high insulin. I mean, there could be stress hormones. They could be, have something to do with sex hormones, like estrogen and so on. Uh, so I think. If you have a problem on a strict low-carb diet, you may have to look for other parts of the solution, basically. Could, could part of it be that there are other causes of insulin resistance that possibly. are still driving Poss the Possibly. Okay. Can we have one more question over on the right? Yes. Hi, Andreas. Hi, Stefan. Um, I had a couple of brief points I want to make. One of them is that I totally agree that food reward is not the only cause of obesity. And I certainly hope that that's not being attributed to me. Um, but the other thing I want to say, I just wanted to explain a couple of the more straightforward reasons why the insulin idea of obesity has very little traction among obes obesity researchers. And one of them is, you know, you see elevated insulin in obesity, but the problem is that you have a concomitant increase in insulin resistance. So, I mean, what really matters is the amount of insulin signaling that's occurring, not the amount of circulating insulin. And what you see in obesity is actually a reduction in total insulin action on both lean and fat tissues. And so um, the other thing is that, you know, there are various experimental models of obesity, and there are some pretty straightforward means of blocking insulin resistance that typically develops on those diets. And one of the things that's been observed is it actually has no impact on the rate of fat gain when you block the hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance that occur on these diets. So, and that, that's been demonstrated in a few different species. So I was curious to hear your thoughts on that. Sure, I mean, of course there are objections, different kinds of objections, but I think if you look at the whole picture, you, what emerges is something that's fairly strong and robust anyway. Uh, Obviously, if you have uh, an obese person with a high insulin level, he's probably going to be insulin resistant too. And, and what comes first is like a, a chicken or, or the egg kind of problem. And, and, and some obesity researchers, like you say, uh, are sure that it's um, the insulin resistance first. Other people think the other way. And if you ask me, I would say I, I think they develop together, sort of step in step. Um, but sure, there are, are valid objections, but I, I still think it's a, on the whole, it's a, it's a robust theory. And it's basically, and the, the bottom line anyway is it, it works for a well, lot of people. Carbohydrate restriction works, but low fat, unrestricted in calories diets do cause fat loss just to a lesser degree than carbohydrate restricted diets. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and, and I absolutely agree that uh, there are lots of different kinds of diets that, that work. Uh, some people say that all diets work. And I think the reason is that what we're transitioning from, the standard American diet, is the most toxic diet known to man. And any change is an improvement. Certainly. It, it, In any form my guess. of restriction of variety essentially in any form will typically result in fat loss as well. Could Sorry, be, yes. don't mean to butt in. We'll have to move this right. into Cheers. a steel cage somewhere. Um, <laughs> thank you very much, thank you. Dr. Einfeld. <laughs>